Boss, the concept of space-time seems so alien to our normal way of thinking that somehow time is a dimension like space and they're integrated together. But scientists, uh, physicists, cosmologists uh, talk about this as though it's, it's, it's common knowledge and we know it is. Um, from a philosopher's point of view, when you uh, try to dig beneath what scientists mean by space-time, what do you come up with? Well, I look at uh, the models that they construct. Um, the models that uh, we had in uh, classical physics uh, could keep time and space quite separate. Um, you could make a model of something in space and then just extrapolate to time as an independent parameter. Right. right? Um, and um, that, that worked very well. Um, it was a matter of... Um, showing how the events and processes that we can measure and observe, how they fit into that kind of framework. Then um, Einstein very rightly criticized the notion of simultaneity that was just taken for granted here and said, if we're going to measure simultaneity, how do we do that? Um, that way he revolutionized the concept by making sure that the concept was something that was connected with something measurable in the right way. And um, suddenly it seemed that the notion of an object that persists in time doesn't seem to be an invariant anymore. <laughs> and um, that uh, the way to talk about the world was more in terms of events and processes that are located in time and space, but not in a way that privileges one particular way of cutting up the space from the time. So this was also a great revolution. And at the time, it was an enormous revolution. Now, uh, we tend to think of quantum mechanics as more revolutionary. <laughs> but at the time, it was you know, as shocking. The idea that you couldn't say, you couldn't make an absolute distinction between the present and past and future. Because the present, well, that's not an invariant. As you, you know, if, if you go to another frame of reference, what was present for one person was actually a little bit before and a little bit after for another one. If they're moving relative If they're moving relative, relative to, to each other. other. Yes, yeah. exactly. Um, so I think that uh, the big, uh, um, which, uh, the real impact was on the notion of object. Um, that um, there's a classical notion of an object as something that persists in time. Mm. And that has its own history. Okay? Now we can still talk about objects, of course. But if you try to identify the same thing across time in a, in a continuum, you only have arbitrary choices left. And that was new. You know, that, that should be something arbitrariness in a continuous medium over time. Um, if we now think about objects in the old way, what we have to say is, well, um, we can identify that you know, roughly in that kind of picture. Um, and, uh, well, as I say, now we are used to it rather. You know, we are used to that way of thinking. And so what follows from that? How can our understanding of, of, uh, of our reality um, improve by that, mm. that getting closer to some truth like that? Well, you know, I... I I should say that I've been talking about it again as an empiricist. Right? Um, back in the 17th century, Newton thought of space and time as entities. And it was Leibniz who insisted that, no, we are just talking about relations between the way things happen, relations between objects, relations between events, um, and how that can be embedded in a mathematical structure. Well, he called it an ideal structure. But okay. Um, now, with respect to space-time, you see the same kind of debate that there are philosophers who say they are substantivalist. They say that space-time itself is a substance. And there are philosophers and physicists who say, no, they have a relational view. What there is, is matter, uh, material events, how they are related to each other. And that structure, that physical structure, it can be embedded in this kind of model this kind of space-time manifold, and perhaps not in another one. 
society. And so in that model, the space-time sort of is the product of the relation between the mass as opposed to being a real substance a, a, of itself? Exactly, exactly. You've got the, the physical events and the relations between them on the one hand, mm -hmm. you have a mathematical structure that the physicist constructs. Mm -hmm. And you relate the two to each other. Right. That's an empiricist point of view. Right. Okay. Now, of course, there are arguments. Uh, Newton had an argument. Uh, he said that if you had two balls connected with a string, and they were all alone in the universe, you might wonder, are they rotating around each other or not? <laughs> and he said, um, well, if motion is just relative, that would, the question doesn't make sense. Right. But if you cut the string, if they move away from each other, you know there was tension and that they were actually rotating. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not a good argument, because it's an argument that is good within his theory. You have to accept his theory first, then it's a good argument. Mm -hmm. But the argument was supposed to support his theory, <laughs> you see? So now there are similar arguments now. So for example, one that I've just recently looked at is um, in, in models of general relativity, um, there are of course models in which there's zero matter, the vacuum state, right? But there can be gravitational waves and they can differ. So you can have two different models, zero matter, different gravitational waves. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no empirically testable difference here I mean, a world with zero matter, we don't exist in it. There's no way to talk about testing that, mm. right? You would have to talk about something totally counterfactual. What if something were dropped in the world like that? <laughs> you would have a different effect. But I mean, that's not realistic. That is not empirical testing, you see? So I think we really, at that point, we get into a kind of metaphysics. But there is one important thing about it that it is possible for the metaphysical picture to point physicists to different kinds of models. And so they can have heuristic value. Mm -hmm. The metaphysics can have heuristic value. That I would never deny. Selection among different possibilities. Exactly, exactly. Those who are, are, are substantivalists, who mm. believe that space-time is a substance, so what, what, what would follow from that? <laughs> You know, all that follows from it is that they claim to have an explanation, whereas the empiricist has no explanation. But, but says you can't go further. You, you, you yeah. reject the possibility of even going further. Yes, yes. So they say that, um, you know, if we, give, if, we, if we grant some sort of reality, some causal reality to the metric field, for example, mm -hmm. we can explain phenomena. Whereas if you just say, Oh, what the scientist does is he shows how these phenomena fit into the model you only describe. And I say this demand for explanation is metaphysics. <laughs> it's not science. It's not physics. Right? And so almost at every p part that somebody wants to push it to an explanation, you as the, as the watchdog empiricist <laughs> <laughs> says, well, yeah. stop and no further. Yeah. Well, you know, what I would like to do is to make empiricism attractive. <laughs> Maybe if I do it in that tone of voice, it's not going to work. <laughs> I, I think empiricism is a very attractive way of looking at the world. Um, and that these metaphysical ways, they don't have that kind of attraction. Well, look, the, the truth is, all kidding aside, we want truth. Yes. And if truth can't go beyond a certain point, you know, I sure don't want to go there, even if mm -hmm. I'd like the result better. Yeah, I would just say, you know, it's not science, it's not physics, right? And, um, you know, I've often talked with, um, you know, physicists who are not at the high theoretical level. And, um, and they are as curious about it as you are, <laughs> you know, and as I am, and they say, you know, I've heard that there are these alternative interpretations that philosophers and phys other physicists, theoretical physicists, mm -hmm. have come up with. Um, and, I and I say, yeah, let's talk about them, and we talk about them, it's interesting. And then they say, is there any testable difference? Is there any experiment you do? Yeah. I said, no, they are designed, that there should be no experiment <laughs> to decide. You know, and one of them said to me, well, in that case, you know, they should just go home and play with it at home, you know. <laughs> and I thought, you know, that's also the empiricist attitude, really, you know. And I think it's the working scientist attitude, too.